Um, so learning objectives for today, the, the neurobiology of addiction is impossible to, to even scratch the surface on in a 30 minute talk. Um, and so we will, we will try to get through it as best as we can. Um, it turns out, I guess I have extra time because we don't have a patient case. So um, I will still try to go fast through that through it. Um, it's also really difficult to um, approach it from the perspective of, of the audience that has a vast, um, variety of, of different uh, specialties. So I will try to do my best, but learning objectives for this to understand the brain processes that lead to addiction, to review brain anatomy and neurotransmitters involved in addiction, and then to discuss how neurobiology of addiction can help providers to treat patients. Whether you are a social worker, a psychologist, a pharmacist, or a physician um, treating patients, I think that knowing more about the neurobiology can really help them. So. Uh, next slide, please. So ASAM, the, addiction, the American Society of Addiction Medicine has defined addiction. Um, and I think it's worth reviewing their, um, their definition. They actually came out with a new one in 2019 that's a little less wordy. Um, and they say addiction is a treatable chronic, me chronic medical disease um, involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, and the environment, and an individual's life experiences People who with addiction use substances or engage in behaviors that become compulsive and often continue despite harmful consequences. Um, next slide, please. Here's the old definition that came out of 2011. Um, it's a lot wordier, but I think it actually explains a lot of, basically we're gonna talk about these, these different things from a neurobiological perspective. So primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory and related circuitry. So there's dysfunction in these circuits that leads to the characteristic manifestations that we see in all aspects of life. Um, is reflected in an individual's pathologically pursuing reward and relief from substances. It's characterized by an inability to abstain, impairment in behavioral control, cravings, diminished recognition of significant problems, with one's behaviors, which is a big one, and also dysfunctional emotional response to things. So those are some of the big keys to that. Um, like other chronic diseases, addiction often involves cycles of relapse and remission. So we will talk about it from that perspective. You know, there's there's a um, there's a group of people that that would prefer to not call addiction a disease, um, and would prefer to call it a, a process of maladaptive learning or, you know, there's a lot of ways to kind of approach this. I think that, that those who don't want to call it a disease, th there's some good reasoning behind that. Um, but in the end, the, by calling it a, a disease, what we are recognizing is that it's a set of dysfunctions that is common across the, the spectrum of people with this disease and have common treatments and, and prognoses across that. So I think it is very useful to actually refer to addiction as a disease. We're not gonna discuss that too much, but I wanted to bring that up. Next slide, please. So um, Nora Volkow, who is the um, director of um, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, um, she released a um, paper a couple of years back um, where a lot of this data has come from. And she kind of gives us a good definition of neurobiology, or excuse me, a good definition of addiction from a neurobiological perspective. And I think that this, this first point here, if this is all we, we remember, I, I think that it's enough. Um, addiction is a dramatic dysregulation of motivational circuits. So everything that happens in the brain that causes us to be motivated to do anything can become dysregulated um, in a dramatic fashion with, with addiction. So that's really the biggest key take home that I want people to have is that motivation gets messed up. Um, it gets hijacked. Um, as part of this dysregulation of motivational circuits, there's an in exaggerated incentive salience. We'll talk about that here in a minute, but basically in the importance of things. So there, there's an exaggerated sense of importance of the wrong things or things that we don't actually want to be important. There's habit formation um, and, and an inability to kind of shift from those habits um, that, are, that are done. There's reward deficits. So things that should cause rewards are, are no longer causing rewards in our system and therefore we don't seek out natural reward systems. There's an increased stress response. Um, 
that occurs that, that leads to more compulsive drug use. And then there's compromised executive functioning. Um, and that's one of the one of the more important parts because a lot of times we see addiction and we think, why would anyone do that? Why, why are they ruining their life? Um, and it's because they're the part of their brain that is responsible for rational behavior is not working. Next slide, please. Um, so we're not, I'm gonna briefly touch on this, but we're not going to discuss this because we don't really have time, but we know in the, in the neurobiology of addiction is dependent on development and genetics and the way the brain forms from, from the very first cell all the way up till age 25 or beyond. Um, there's a genetic predisposition for people to, to have addiction disorders, to have substance use disorders, or to um, display this um, addictive behavior. And we see that from studies done in twins or, or siblings or, or parents and, and children. There are personality traits that are thought to be heritable that are also associated with or have a high comorbidity with substance use, things like impulsivity um, or increased pleasure seeking. Um, early development of the brain and exposure to drugs as a, at a young age is makes substance use disorders worse in the long run. So adolescents who use substances recreational, recreationally are much more likely to go on and have a full-blown substance use disorder than fully grown adults who use a substance recreationally. That becomes important with the use of cannabis, which a lot of us consider to be not a significant drug of abuse, but it is in teenagers because it can really change the way that they, their brain develops. Um, life events, particularly in childhood and adolescence can, can really influence um, the development of, of addictive disorders. Um, trauma, attachment disorders especially really contribute to this. And some people will, will, will say there's so much interrelation between trauma and substance use disorders that um, they, they treat them the same. I imagine there are cases of people that, that have substance use disorders who do not have trauma, but it is incredibly common. Um, and then comorbid psychiatric disorders are often associated with um, substance use disorders. So all these things can help contribute to and make someone susceptible to a substance use disorder. Um, but I'm going to kind of put that to the to the side for another day. Um, can you go to the next slide? So the next question is why why is it as important for us to even learn about the neurobiology of, of addiction? Um, knowledge about a disease does not cure disease. If it did, then we'd have a much easier time treating heart disease, diabetes. It's, it's actually that the medicine of diabetes is really quite simple. Um, and if you could just teach someone how to eat right and give themselves their insulin or take their medications and get exercise, we would cure diabetes, but we don't. Diabetes type two, that is. But we don't because knowledge about the disease doesn't in and of itself cure the disease. So why is it important to know about neurobiology? Um, there's a YouTube video from um, Dr. John Strznikas. Uh, he's an addiction psychiatrist at UCSF. The link for that YouTube video is at the end of um, in my references. But he um, he basically says that addiction is primarily a limbic disorder, not a cognitive disorder. So we're not going to think our th ourselves out of uh, addiction. We're not going to help our patients think themselves out of addiction. Um, so how can we use the knowledge about neurobiology of addiction to take better, better care of our patients? We'll discuss that a little bit later on. First, we're gonna jump into the science though. So next slide. Um, so an overview of kind of the complex neural processes. So the brain regions that are, that are most involved in addiction, really the entire brain can be involved in addiction, but the brain regions that are most involved are the ventral, ventral tegmental area um, of the thalamus, the nucleus accumbens, which is the reward center, the prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain um, that, that does the thinking, the executive function, and then the limbic system, which there's a lot of parts of the limbic system, but the amygdala, the hippocampus, the anterior cingulate gyrus are really important. Um, next slide, please. So here's where I don't have control of the, um, of the mouse. So Lachelle, I hope you know your brain areas. Um, so this, this is basically the neuro by the, oh, I, is it moving? Nope, I still don't have. Can you guys see my mouse? Yes, I'm moving it. There it is. Okay, perfect. I got it. All right. 
prefrontal cortex, that's the front area of the brain, that's the thinking part. The, the deep brain here is, actually, I don't know if I have control. You have to click it first. Ah, click and move? Yeah, now you have control. All right, so the deeper brain structures, this is where you get the ventral tegmental area, the nucleus accumbens, um, oops, the, um, hippocampus is right in here and the amygdala. These are the deep brain structures um, of the brain. And then um, in the back you have the cerebellum and then the rest of the cortex. Um, the anterior cingulate gyrus is this area right here. Well, the anterior part of this is the anterior cingulate gyrus. So those are, those are some of the areas involved with it. So um, Dr. Um, Straznikas, um, kind of compares the brain very simply as he compares it to a hand and says, basically you have the um, brain stem, which is like the wrist area. And that area does all of, all of the things that have, um, that we have no idea are going on. So the heart rate regulation, sleep, wake cycles, making sure we're breathing, all of the things that we don't even know are going on in our bodies that are. And then you have the cortex, which is the, the upper area. And that's where we control functions of, of muscles and sensation and vision and, and all that, and including the frontal cortex where we have our thinking and our rational brain. And then you kind of have the middle, the area in the middle, and that's the limbic system. And the limbic system is, is really designed to be the, the bridge between the unconscious processes that happen and, and the conscious processes that we have control over. Um, and that includes emotion and motivation and cognition and, and memories and what to lay down as memories. So um, the limbic system is really where all of the drugs are acting um, that, that people take and that get, people get addicted to. Um, and so the limbic system is really where addiction occurs. Um, and the limbic system, we don't have good control over. So we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, let's go to the next slide. Oh, wait, you gave me control. I can control it now. And it's working. Yes, good. Okay. Um, neurotransmitter systems. So we, we've talked about this before. I've talked about it before. There are over 50 neurotransmitters that we know of. Some of them are proteins. Some of them are really simple compounds. Um, and some of them, we don't even fully know everything that they do. But some of the main ones that, that we see are dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, opioid, um, cannabinoids, glutamate, GABA. Um, these neurotransmitter systems are all in, involved in addiction in some form. Um, and what's also interesting to know is that any drug that is psychoactive, any drug that has an effect on the brain mimics or, or is, the, is the exact duplicate of our own neurotransmitters that we already have. So, so within the dopamine category, you have things like cocaine or methamphetamine. With serotonin, you have serotonin agonists and, and drugs like um, the um, MDMA, Molly, or um, what's the other name for that I can't think of? Um, other drugs like um, psilocybin are in that category. Um, acetylcholine, so acetylcholine is, um, nicotine is a type of acetylcholine receptor agonist. So um, opioids, we have our own endogenous opioids um, that our body produces, but then we have the, the drugs that are produced outside. Cannabinoids, same thing all across the, the board there. GABA is where alcohol and benzodiazepines work. So. Anytime a drug is psychoactive, it's mimicking something that our body already does. Um, so those, those neurotransmitter systems, um, especially dopamine, are involved in addiction. Um, all right. So um, Dr. Volkow in her, in her article that I mentioned and is the, the number one um, on, on my reference sheet, talks about the three stages of, of addiction. Um, that are a recurring cycle. So there's the binge intoxication phase, the withdrawal and negative affect phase, and then the preoccupation anticipation phase, which is craving. And this cycle occurs over and over, repeating itself um, countless times in addictive disorders to where it starts to cause changes in the brain organization, changes in the neurotransmitter systems, which we call neuroplasticity, um, that upregulate or downregulate, meaning that more receptors are made or less receptors are made 
the, the brain adapts to these things over time um, in this. And then as this process continues, the driver, the motivation for drug use shifts from being an impulsive or reward pleasure seeking behavior of someone who may try a drug and say, I'm only trying this once for fun. I'm only doing this to help me study better. I'm only doing this because I like to get, I like to feel good. Um, to becoming more of a compulsive drug use or an avoidance of the negative effects, avoidance of the withdrawal, avoidance of the craving, avoidance of the negative affect that occurs. Um, so within the binge intoxication phase, why do people use drugs? Easy, because it feels good. People feel good when they use a drug. Um, with rare exceptions, people don't really use a drug that makes them feel terrible. Of course, there are terrible effects, side effects of, of drugs. So psilocybin can make people nauseated. People use um, nutmeg or mace, even though it makes them have kind of a dysphoric high. Um, so there are exceptions to that. But really, in the end, people use drugs because it makes them feel good. It activates the reward system. So all of the drugs, whether they are primarily dopaminergic or not, they increase dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is the reward center that I mentioned before. Um, so th this was, oops, let's go back. There we go, okay. Um, this was out of a rat study, um, but it's, it's pretty well um, thought to be basically equivalent in, in humans as well, that when, when you put, into the nucleus accumbens amphetamine, you get a 1,000% of, of the basal increase in dopamine in, in the nucleus accumbens. A huge amount of dopamine is released in, in the nucleus accumbens. Same thing with cocaine. Now, both of those drugs are dopaminergic, but if you look at even nicotine or ethanol, they also have a significant release, even though those drugs aren't dopaminergic. They cause a release of dopamine in the um, nucleus accumbens. So really, you know, why do we have a nucleus accumbens? Why do we have a reward system? Um, and it's, it's basically for, for two other reasons, and that is food and sex. So food will cause an increase, as does um, sex, cause an increase in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. And if you see these numbers, it's 150 for food and 200 for sex, that's very different than the 1000 fold increase that amphetamines cause. Um, but really the, that's the reason that we have um, the nucleus accumbens. So it, it basically helps us to eat and, and to have children. So when the reward system is functioning properly, when it's balanced, it's interacting with the limbic system, it's interacting with the emotional system, telling, getting feedback of, of what should be done and also telling the limbic system what moods to be in. Um, and then it interacts with the prefrontal cortex where our executive function happens and allows us to inhibit certain things when it's functioning properly. And natural rewards lead to survival and propagation of the species. So really we need food and we need sex in order to keep humans existing. Um, and so, so those two things activate the reward system. They feel good to us, so we do more of them. Um, and of course, as we know, those can also have addictive potential as well with, with sex addictions and food addictions that we know about. Um, the neurocircuits involved um, result in inhibitory control um, and decision-making it, when, it, when there's normal function is intact. So our prefrontal cortex can say, I don't need to have sex right now because I'm at work, or I don't need to eat that whole thing, even though my brain's saying I want to. And, but we, we have inhibitory control over that. Um, the, these external sources of, of dopaminergic reward hijack this system. They do it by having an abnormal and, and, and strange to the body um, way of, of doing it. It's, it's an external source, but also with the, those extreme increases in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. And this really hijacks the reward system. And then from there, it hijacks the, the brain's ability to have 
appropriate emotional responses and to have inhibitory control from the, from the rational, reasonable areas of the brain. Um, so getting back to that incentive salience that we talked about before, salience is basically a fancy word for importance, how important something is. So incentive salience can change with drugs um, quite significantly. So basically it's, it's the importance attributed to internal or external things that are going on. So feelings, events, objects, locations, something visual, something auditory, something olfactory um, can all have a um, incentive salience. Um, and that, that can be based on motivation for reward that's derived from previously learned associations. So basically things that we used to do, it, we can get in that situation again and it becomes important to our brain. It says, oh, this isn't important. This is a good place to be. Drug use causes in, uh, incentive salience to anything that's gonna remind the user of the feeling or reward experienced in that setting. So basically the limbic system has GPS, it knows locations. So people who have used drugs in the past that go back to the same neighborhood that they lived in, they're more likely to use again because they're reminded of this every single day. Um, the, the person who, um, I, I like to use the fishing example. So I have here in, in the talk, previously neutral stimuli. So things that didn't cause drug um, cravings or, or desire to use previously can become salient um, and then induce cravings. And so someone who fishes as a means to drink beer, once they are sober and no longer drinking beer, if they only fished because they drank beer, they're not gonna go fishing again without drinking beer. It's just not going to happen. Um, because that, that act of fishing is going to remind them of and become salient for it. It's, it's the same thing that happened with the classical conditioning of, of the um, Pavlov and the, and the dog ringing the bell. So he created incentive salience to the bell by giving the dog food. And then it didn't even need the food anymore. He just needed the bell to make the dog ready to eat food um, and start salivating at the thought of food. So cravings can happen in the exact same way. That bell can be anything that, that was previously associated with drug use. And then you don't have to have the drugs around, you only need that bell to really, to do that. I saw there were some questions here in the, um, the chat box. What are some efficient, reliable ways to assess the extent to which a patient in early recovery can readily access decent executive functioning abilities? I, I, that is a fantastic question. Um, and I think that um, we, we touch on this a little bit later because that is where we, once they're in enough recovery, you can really start to depend more on executive functioning for control of things. Um, but I don't, I don't have any data or, or testing at this point to, to kind of answer the efficient, reliable ways to assess that. Maybe someone else can can weigh in on that when we discuss that later. Sure. I apologize, I don't have, have that answer. Dr. Harris, can I jump in here for a second? Sure. Um, Thank you. So, so here's something to think about when you're working with addiction. So, so that's really the question, right? Because when you're working with folks who have addiction, they're always the last one to know that they have a problem um, simply because I cannot stay in my addiction unless I can't, if I were to own all of the things that I were responsible using with my addictive behaviors, it would be too much for me. And so I cannot stay in it. And so they're usually they're the last to know. And so one of the litmus tests we use around, okay, how do we know when they're going to have really that executive brain functioning back? I think it's important to note right here that it takes, so when they're using, 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 and they come into treatment and they finally get clean, what happens is, is that because they've been taking all of those chemicals, um, they kind of drop in the in the chemicals and then all of a sudden they start to have a big buildup. And that usually occurs within the 30 days to about six weeks. And, and we call this the pink cloud effect. And I think this is really important because especially if you're a private provider and uh, maybe you're not really as familiar with substance abuse. So what happens is, is they've been taking all these drugs, they've been overstimulating their production of dopamine and different chemicals like Dr. Harris has talked about. Um, and then they stop taking the drug and all of a sudden the brain is like, wow, we've had a sharp decrease here. We better, they, and it overproduces. And you all know these clients because they, they're the clients that come in and say, I'm never, ever, ever going to use again. If you are working in a substance abuse facility, they're the clients that become the co-leader of the group that are like, 
giving everybody else, you know, I tried that, I was there, buddy, now I've changed now. Um, and what that really is, is that, that, that they're just overproducing those chemicals in their brain. And so a lot of times that's where they drop out of treatment because they've become the perfect husband again, or the perfect wife, or everybody's really happy with their behaviors. Everyone feels like they got their person back. And then about after the six week mark, those chemicals, your brain says, wait a minute, we're way overproducing. And they, they drop significantly. And that's usually where they relapse and fall back into old habits. And so, so we really say really clean time, they need six to nine months clean time um, before they're really got all of that, <clears throat> excuse me, executive functioning back. But I think it's an important piece to note because if you're seeing them in a private practice, that's what you're gonna see about 30 days, to six weeks in, they're gonna come in and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I ever did that. I'm never ever gonna do that again. They're back to being the perfect husband or wife or child. Um, but just understand that that's just sort of a blip in time. So anyway, I hope that helps. Can I add something to <clears throat> uh, One of the things as a counselor that I notice in most of my clients that relapse is they don't initially relapse because they think they're gonna go use whatever substance. They go fishing. And that's a reference to the slide. And that is that they know those things that surround their use and their relapse. And they avoid those things for a very long time as well as the use of whatever substance. But the first thing that brings them back to a relapse situation is oh, you know, I haven't seen that friend for a while, or I saw that friend, so we just thought we'd go, you know, have a chat someplace. Or in other words, they kind of go fishing again, and then that just develops immediately into some type of relapse. Yeah, and, and, and that really has a lot to do with the positive effects that they're getting from the drug use. So this incentive salience that says, oh, this is where you drink, and when you drink, you feel good, and the motivation is to seek that reward, um, that intoxication phase, um, because they've been reminded of, of that in this situation. So that, I think that's a perfect example. Thank you. Um, okay, next slide. So, so moving on from that, that intoxication um, phase into the withdrawal and the negative affect. So neuroadaptation or changes in, in the neurology of the brain can occur pretty quickly in response to persistent presence of a drug. Um, then when you remove that drug, it doesn't immediately reverse the changes to the receptors that were caused by that drug. So certain receptors will be down-regulated or there won't be as many available um, because of a drug. The body's always trying to get back to the same equilibrium or others will be up-regulated and in the presence of the drug all the time. And then you take away that drug and suddenly there's another disequilibrium in the opposite direction. And that's what withdrawal is um, that, that we see. Um, and that's associated with a negative, the, the really negative affect of that. Um, not only does that neural adaptation result in withdrawal, but of course it also causes tolerance. So tolerance that when they're taking the drug, they never get that, that same fix. They're always chasing the dragon from the first time they used heroin. They, they need more and more of the drug to, to continue to um, get the good, happy reward system. Um, in addition to that, there are, at, there are adaptations that are basically considered anti-reward via the amygdala and the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which is one of those deep brain structures that really goes without, without much input from, from the thinking brain, that, that those start to change with chronic use and lead to an exaggerated stress response. So there's when anything stressful happens, it's more stressful than it used to be. So that leads to an increased avoidance of anything stressful, anything negative, um, and really leads to, to, to avoidance. Rather than drug seeking for reward, it leads to drug seeking to avoid anything negative. Um, and this anti-reward adaptation is what contributes to the transition from impulsive drug use that I mentioned before to compulsive drug use. So they're no longer just using to get high, they're using to not feel bad. They're using to not experience withdrawal. They're using because they can't cope in life without it. Um, 
And this process continues well beyond the acute withdrawal phase um, and contributes to kind of that protracted or subacute withdrawal that can last weeks, months, even, even years in people. So um, that's that, that second phase where it, when it repeats over and over again, it really builds up this negative affect. Um, going on. The third phase is the preoccupation and anticipation phase, which is the craving phase. Um, cravings are hard to define. And, and in fact, when they try to study cravings, it's really difficult to kind of really pinpoint. But the, the way I describe it is, is a, an anticipatory anxiety brought about that, that encourages the brain to do a specific behavior or take a specific drug. So it's, a, it's an anxiety state. It's an uncomfortable feeling um, that, that leads to a compulsive use. So the body, the brain compels the body to do something to relieve this anxiety. Cravings can occur as part of the withdrawal process itself, but they can also occur days, months, even years after abstinence from the drug. They can be induced by something. So one thing that can happen that is the kind of reverse of what we've been talking about, the, the effect on the prefrontal cortex from the limbic system is someone can have a craving much later that actually is brought on by the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex can notify the limbic system of something salient. They can notify the limbic system of, hey, you're in that situation that you were in before, you're fishing again, you're doing that. And that induces the cascade of the emotional and motivational desires to use again, that suddenly goes from, I wasn't even thinking about alcohol to now I really just want that beer. My, my mouth is salivating, I hear that bell ringing. Um, one way, one good example of this is someone who's in prison, um, in the beginning they, they may have withdrawal from their drug of use. Often it can, be, it can be alcohol, it can be heroin, it can be methamphetamine, any drug. And then they get to the point where they're no longer in acute withdrawal and they're in prison and they know that they have no access to these drugs. And their, so their prefrontal cortex is basically never sends them a message reminding them of the drug. So they can go their entire time in prison without having cravings for the drug. And then it starts to get close to the discharge date and the prefrontal cortex reminds them, hey, you're getting out of jail, you could use. So they've gone months, years without any thought, any craving for, a, for the drug and suddenly their brain notifies them, you're gonna get out and, and reactivates that system. The same thing will happen from drug courts. So they'll be in drug courts and they'll be like, I'm never gonna use anything. And they don't have any trouble avoiding anything, including marijuana. They just don't use it. They don't even think about it because they know if they get caught in vets court or drug court, they're going to jail. Um, and then they get done and they think that everything is, is finished but, they, but it isn't. And their prefrontal cortex re, reminds their limbic system, hey, you could use now and not get caught. Um, so that, um, that's one way it kind of goes backwards from the prefrontal cortex. And then unfortunately that executive dysfunction occurs as, as a result. So the prefrontal cortex sends that initial signal rationally and then becomes overwhelmed by the, the limbic system from there. Um, so, um, I wanna move on to how we can use this in inpatient care. I noticed there's a couple other comments I'm gonna read real quick. You guys can read over this slide. Um, thank you, Dr. Worthen. Um, are we coming out of here to show us what's going um, I am gonna, uh, the second question, I am going to um, defer at this time to maybe dis discuss offline or, or um, after we're done, if that's okay, um, if we can, if we can note that, um, but, um, yeah, so I, I think that that's worth discussing, but let's, let's get back to that. Um, I'm going to come back to the, to the slideshow for right now. Um, so, um, yeah, so how do we use this in patient care? I brought this up at the beginning, the knowledge, the knowledge of this, how, you know, how is this gonna help us help our patients just knowing all of these things? Um, and I believe that it can. One way that it can is that it can help patients to, to recognize. So them knowing more about it, they can really begin to recognize the balance of self-control, self-actualization, self-efficacy against those neurological drives that take over their life. 
and, and kind of get a, an appropriate sense of responsibility for it. Um, and so um, this brings up, this is also from Dr. St I can't remember his name, Straczynski's um, presentation um, that he uses, but the, there's the old joke, where does an 800 pound gorilla sit? And the answer is anywhere it wants. So um, as, essentially addiction or really even the limbic system in general can be compared to this 800 pound gorilla. Um, if the 800 pound gorilla is not in the cage, it's gonna sit wherever it wants and you have no control over it and you've completely lost that control. The prefrontal cortex is like the trainer at the circus who can, can work with this gorilla, keep it in, in the cage and, and not let it out. And when the, when the prefrontal cortex or when the trainer does let the gorilla out and then the gorilla goes on a rampage, there's still responsibility from the, the trainer for letting that out but it's, it, there's also zero control at that point. So I think that's a good way of comparing it to patients to be able to say, yeah, there are gonna be times where you have zero control, zero sense of control over it, that 800 pound gorilla is out of the cage. Um, and your job is to keep it in the cage and keep it fed and keep it from getting hungry and keep it from getting angry because you can't tell, you can't starve the gorilla in the cage and then put some bananas there and say, don't eat a banana it's going to eat the banana when he's hungry. Um, and that's going to happen. So, so addiction can be lived with. It can be that 800 pound gorilla that can be controlled, but it's still an 800 pound gorilla that, that needs to be, um, needs to have that control and needs to not allow, be allowed to get hungry or angry or, um, any of those things. So, um, I think that that's one way to really help patients with the, with knowing more about the neurobiology is that they, they can get their own sense of, I can have control over this and I can control the parts that I, that to make sure that the parts that I can't control aren't active. Um, another reason that, that it's important to know this is that as, as providers, if we know that patients' abilities to make sound decisions and act rationally is, is messed up, with their motivation, we can empathize more with the patient. We don't have to say, why in the world would they do this? We don't have to, we don't have to deal with that frustration. Of course, they're going to lie to us. That's part of the, the disease. They have no executive functioning to say they don't want to lie. It doesn't mean they're a morally corrupt person. It means they have a, an addictive disorder that's taken over their ability to, to think rationally, to use their executive functioning that can help prevent burnout and that can really build a better therapeutic relationship that really builds to, to better patient care. Um, medications. So how can this help us with, with choosing medications? So knowing this process of, of the neurobiology and knowing where they're at in the recovery process can really help with, with choosing what medications um, to use. So we kind of talked about earlier, Amy had mentioned the patient nine months out. It's very different what kind of cravings they might have, where, what kind of approach you have to that person from a therapeutic approach, but also from a medication perspective. So early on in recovery process, you may be targeting just the cravings. You may be trying to get them to have less of that salience. So naltrexone might reduce the, the, um, in the incentive salience of alcohol for a patient or gabapentin may reduce the, the distress caused from being not able to drink in that moment. Um, it might, you, they might be in the phase where you can stabilize that negative affect and the prolonged withdrawal. Buprenorphine is a great example in opioid use disorder. If you can give um, somebody buprenorphine for, then they don't, they not only don't experience the acute withdrawal, but it can also really help them feel normal from all of those negative affects in that dysfunctional anti um, reward system that with the increased stress. So it can be really useful for that. Um, you, or, you know, later on, you can actually assist the free, the prefrontal cortex in inhibiting incentive salience. So once someone's through the initial cravings and the withdrawal period, something like antabuse or disulfiram can actually be effective because they, they will know, similar to being in prison, they know they can't drink, so they don't even think about it. If they're beyond that initial withdrawal, beyond that initial 
craving to seek reward and they're kind of in this maintenance phase, then by being on disulfiram, they, it's like they're in prison and their prefrontal cortex will never send a message to the limbic system of, hey, you should drink because it knows that you can't drink. So you can really ad adjust your medications according to where they're at in the, in the recovery process and according to the neurobiology. Um, and then therapy, lastly, therapy can shift focus based on where the, the patient is at in the recovery process. And Amy talked about this and feel free to jump back in, but um, early on, you may be helping patients to understand their emotions and check in with their bodies and minds, basically the interoception, so that the more knowledge that they have of what emotions they're feeling, what internal sensations, it can reduce that negative affect, decrease cravings, and that conscious awareness can lead to better prefrontal control of what's going on. Um, early on, in you help them avoid situations. So same thing with that, that hungry gorilla, you don't, you don't get them around bananas early on when they have cravings for, for the, the drug that caused that negative affect where they're trying to not go into withdrawal um, or, or treat the, the symptoms that are making them feel terrible, they cannot be around bananas. They cannot be around their drugs. So really helping them early on to just avoid those situations. And then improving executive functioning um, and reinforcing inhibitory control as they spend more time in recovery can be really important. I just got a message saying that my internet connection is really poor. I hope I've been coming across okay, but um, I welcome comments from, from all the therapists here. Um, and let me finish up with key points and then I think we'll have some time for some questions, but the key points, addiction is a complex biological process. It's influenced by genetics, environment, exposures, um, and of course, it's influenced by what drugs that, that people are using. The processes that lead to addiction um, and cause the relapsing chronic use can be understood and used therapeutically to help patients in recovery. And despite the hijacking of the limbic system and the loss of control and executive functioning, patients can learn to live with their addiction and maintain recovery and be responsible for their own um, sobriety and recovery. Um, with that, oh, questions, and then the, the um, uh-oh, there it is. Yeah, perfect, references. Um, so I'll open up to questions, comments, and I'll give control back. Thank you, Dr. Harris. What questions or comments do people have before I start calling on people? You know, sometimes I've had the impression that some of the lying that patients do is more about us than about the addiction per se. If you show disappointment, frustration, anger, if you shame them, or you have these programs where if you relapse, you're out of the program. I mean, this kind of stuff is going to help people want to lie too. Towards that, I was thinking, uh, first, great presentation, Dr. Harris, and, uh, I, you know, talked about how in the definition, or at least the 2011 definition, that, that lack of insight or impaired ability to recognize dysfunction or impairment as a result of substance use is kind of part of the definition. And I was thinking so many of our screeners rely on patient report, and in my own practice, as I'm screening for substance use disorders, I often ask people, you know, what, what problems have you had in your life as a result of this substance use? And when they deny those, I sometimes move on. And now I'm realizing, I guess I've realized before that, um, yeah, are, are, are screeners putting too much weight on that and how to address that? I don't know, that, that thought came to mind that we might be overlooking or not, not uh, capturing early enough if we're not uh, attuned to the fact that the disease process itself inhibits insight. Well, Dr. Litchfield, I think this goes back to my presentation some months ago about the importance of collateral contact of not just taking a patient's word for it, but what do people in their system observe about them? 
Yeah, great questions and reflections. What else would you say to that, Dr. Harris or Amy? I'm giving Amy time to jump in with that. Um, but no, I think I think that that's completely right. I think that we the way we assess patients, um, we sometimes expect them to know how dysfunctional they are, and clearly that is not. So um, you know, one one caveat with using the DSM is that it needs to be used by a clinician trained to use the DSM. So you can't just give somebody all the criteria for any kind of disorder and say. If, if they put a check mark next to it, then they definitely have the disorder. It has to be taken in the context of other, other information that you're getting from collateral or that you're getting from labs or that you're just kind of sensing from them that they're not telling you um, to really say, you know, I think there is an actual problem here, um, even though they denied any problems from that. Yes, sorry about that. The uh, FedEx guy came at the same time he called my name, which set off the dog brigade at my house. So. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, what you're saying, Dr. Harris, is correct. And oftentimes, too, the, the hardest part is that if the it's typically the client that is the last to know. They know, but they don't know. Um, and so oftentimes, if you just give them a straight set of questions, they're not going to answer those. So you're really your best way to find out that, if, like, if you went down the DSM criteria or something like that, they're not going to answer those Sometimes we call it a poor historian <laughs> as accurately as we'd like them to answer them. So your, your, best, your best tool is to listen to what they're saying for patterns, um, uh, themes. You know, a lot of times there's a lot of themes around everybody's wronged me, you know, my family, they just kicked me out for no reason. Things that would make you kind of go, I wonder what's, it's, so when you're dealing with addiction, you sort of have to take that next step and ask more questions about hmm, what's really going on here. Like all my friends will have anything to do with me and my family's kind of booted me. I'm just a really good person. Um, those are the things that usually kind of clue you in. I have a question for Dr. Harris. Please. Uh, Dr. Harris, I uh, appreciate you showing us the uh, different medications that you can use to help with addiction. I think I know the answer to my question, but uh, when we have so many addicts, I'm assuming the only time that we can ever use that medication in a preventive way is if the person has come to a physician or a therapist or somebody seeking help and being willing then to take those medications. Is, that, is there any other way we can help? Uh, well, in prison, for example, when they're a captive audience, is there anything we can do there? Thank you. Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking it. Um, you are right. Right now, we um, we haven't we can't reach all the people that are using um, some evidence from a couple of years ago. I um, it's probably a good ten years old, but um, for alcohol use um, was that less than less than ten percent of people in treatment for alcohol use were getting offered medications to help with with alcohol use. So they were doing all the psychosocial things, but not the um, medications that can help. Um, when it comes to opioids, I think we're doing a lot better and Idaho is doing a significant amount better, but we still have a ways to go with, with opioids. We have a lot of providers who can prescribe Suboxone or buprenorphine throughout the, the state. We have methadone clinics. We're getting potentially getting more methadone clinics in the state of Idaho to really help with this. But, but again, your question of how do we get these people there is a great answer. One of the answers is, get it started in the ER. So there's a huge, a huge push for, for getting Suboxone started. You know, someone comes in, they've overdosed on heroin, they get Narcan, they're watched in the ER for a few minutes, the ER makes sure they're not suicidal, um, and then they let them go. Um, and they don't start Suboxone because they don't know how to get it started, they don't know how to get them follow up, they don't know who's gonna pay for it. And so the, the patient who just overdosed and could have died leaves and then they use heroin again. So that's one area. Prisons is another area where historically they cannot have access to medication for opioid use disorder. They do not get access to Suboxone in, in the prisons. And hopefully that can be changing at least as they are being released because we know that when they're released it is a huge risk for relapse. As I had mentioned in my talk, once they know they're out they are, they are very likely going to have intense cravings for it, but also their receptors have changed back since they've been in. And if they go back to using the same amount of heroin they used before they went to prison, they're gonna die of an overdose, an accidental overdose. So we have a lot of work to do on this. 
a lot of, of community outreach. So basically people on the streets, people in the community need to know that these medications are accessible um, and then they need to be able to have access to it. And right now with COVID, I think, you know, it's taking the back seat, but when we figure out COVID, we, we're going to be right back to opioid, the opioid epidemic being the, the primary killer of Idahoans again. And I think that it, we have work to do on that. So a quick follow-up question, if I may. Uh, so it's a public awareness issue to some extent. I serve on Joint Finance Appropriation Committee. Uh, obviously, uh, if we talk, well, Office of Drug Policy, it seems like there's more that possibly they could do on this issue. And uh, there's always a question of money. Is there more money that uh, could be thrown at this? That would be some kind of a media campaign. I'm a huge uh, advocate and uh, supporter of ECHO and all that you do. And so uh, any thoughts or whatever that you have, I'd be uh, happy to receive those at uh, sgrow, at, that's G-R-O-W last name, at senate.idaho.gov from any of you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and I agree. I think the Office of Drug Policy is doing quite a bit. Um, with with what funds they have and and um, the echo program is is incredible and provides training for everyone across Idaho. We've opened a little bit of a self um, bragging here, but we've opened up two fellowships in in addiction here out of the Boise area, one through the University of Washington, one through fMRI. Um, and we have our first class of of trainees um, working here who will now go into the community. Um, here in, in Idaho and expand addiction treatment and the knowledge of that. So I think we're, we're heading the right way. So, but thank you for your comments and for your, your help in working towards helping Idaho with this. One Amy quick comment for Senator Grove, uh, in terms of a, a medication, if it was really easy for people to get Narcan, um, that would prevent a lot of deaths. Dr. Wortham, will you remind us what Narcan is? It's a medication that can be injected or nasal spray that will um, block the brain receptors that are involved with opiates and prevent uh, death from overdose. If it's given soon enough and um, the information is available and most people uh, can understand what to do and with the nasal spray, as I understand it, I'm not a medical, uh, I don't have a medical background, but as I understand it, the nasal spray works quite well. Thank if I can respond, respond to that, a uh, couple of thoughts. Number one, uh, I'm hoping we could do something earlier than at the point of death. And number two, uh, providing that for everybody is kind of like providing needles to everybody. Uh, is there, you know, you're, I see your uh, psychiatrist. Does that uh, make a user more apt to use because he knows if he does overdose that he's got the stuff and somebody can help him out of it? No, the, the answer is no. And there's a lot of great research on that question. It's an under, understandable question. It's one of the first things I wondered when I heard about this, but both uh, needle exchange or clean needle harm reduction programs and uh, uh, easily available Narcan, neither of those interventions uh, or prevention, preventative measures cause an increase in opioid dependence. Thank you. Hi, Senator Grove. Uh, uh, can I, uh, sorry, did I interrupt someone? Remind us who and where you are and go for it. Oh, this is Sharon Carswell. I'm a local physician. And I just wanted to, to put out there there, I think there's an issue that faces the hope with uh, charging victims with crimes. And I, I think if there's a way to, um, you know, make this this issue, I, I I tend to to like looking at substance abuse as, as more of a disorder than a disease. Although I appreciate what your sentiment about why it's beneficial to look at it as a disease, and you know, make help more accessible and less shameful, and even decriminalize it. I think we will uh, make progress in this area. So I just wanted to mention that because I, I think that there is a, a community awareness now that that is not a safe place to go. And uh, I don't know how, I don't know how, you know, we can help these patients um, seek the help they need. Thank you for sharing that, Sharon. Amy, Dr. Carswell, Amy, did you have insights? That was 
I just wanted to say, uh, again, I appreciate Senator Grow, um, you coming to the ECHO and hearing all of this. And I know you have a, a key position and have been a really great advocate for addictions and for funding for mental health in our state. And, um, and I would just like to echo too that uh, we really need more Narcan and it doesn't cause people to use more. It doesn't, it, it really actually saves their lives. They're actually quite reluctant to take it oftentimes. Um, and the other thing that we've come across this year that is an interesting thing is as we're talking about harm reduction, currently right now in the state of Idaho, it's illegal to have a fentanyl testing strip. So a fentanyl testing strip will test a drug to see if it has fentanyl in it, which the overdose rate on fentanyl is horrific. Like, I mean, it's just horrific. And so, um, but it is illegal and you can actually be charged for having a strip that you could test a drug to see if it had fentanyl in it um, prior to taking it. And so I, th I think that's an issue that we have to sort of look at and decide on. Um, you know, again, it comes down to that harm reduction thought mindset of, hey, if we can keep them off fentanyl and keep them from dying and then hopefully get them into treatment and that kind of stuff, it could be really helpful. But just to kind of bring that to your attention, that's an issue that we've run into lately. Yeah, I, I was not aware that there even was a fentanyl strip, nor legislation that prevents it. Do you, Amy, do you have an idea of why or the thought process behind making that illegal, what the story is? It's, it's considered as drug paraphernalia. So you would get charged oh, okay. with a drug paraphernalia charge if oh, you have okay. a fentanyl testing strip. Okay, thank you. So, and I can provide you some more information offline around. Yeah, that. go ahead and shoot it to me. You know how to do it. 